Hello viewers, we shall continue our discussion on 8051 assembly language programming and in today's lecture we shall discuss about subroutines and interrupts. You may be asking how subroutines and interrupts are related to each other. You will find that whenever an interrupt occurs, the processor jumps to a interrupt service subroutine. So, in case of interrupt also you are jumping to a subroutine, special type of subroutine, we call it interrupt service subroutine and in case of normal subroutine call also it jumps to a new location where the subroutine uh, program is stored. Of course, there are similarities and differences, we shall discuss about them in this lecture. First of all, the need for subroutine is already known to you in the context of modular, modular programming where you divide a complex big task into a number of subtasks and each of the subtasks is independently uh, designed, developed, tested, debugged and so on. This, this is facilitated by subroutines because each of the modules are written in the form of subroutine. That is why the need for subroutine is, uh, is there and in modular programming and uh, the, uh, let us see how the processor, uh, how the processor supports uh, the subroutines. We have seen that the 8051 is provided with two different types of subroutine calls. One is called sort absolute call where the address is 11 bit that is provided as part of the instruction and it is a 2 byte instruction because uh, 8 bit comes uh, in the second byte and the 5 bit of the address comes as part of the opcode as it is shown here and uh, then uh, it jumps to within 4k bytes of memory locations. That means 11 bytes provides you 4 kilobytes of memory locations. This is very convenient whenever your program is within the on chip 4 kilobytes of ROM. So, in that case this uh, sort absolute call addressing is very useful and however, whenever you are using full uh, 64 kilobytes of memory uh, using external memory, in such case you have to use long absolute call or long call. In such a case the 16 bit address uh, comes as part of the instruction. Uh, in the first byte is opcode, the subsequent two bytes are the, uh, the addresses and uh, whenever then these are the two subroutine calls and associated with subroutines you have got return, this, this RET stands for return for subroutine and of course as I told in the ca case of interrupt there will be also jump to interrupt service subroutine. In such case also there will be return instruction, however there you have to use a separate return instruction RETI return for interrupt and why such a uh, why a different instruction is needed uh, that we shall explain later we have already mentioned about it. So, this is what is provided uh, by the 8051 uh, two subroutine call instructions and two return instructions. Now, let us see uh, what happens what are the various uh, issues related to subroutines. First of all, there will be a, uh, a it will invoking a call, invoking a call. This is the first point, invoking a call. This will happen whenever in the program uh, a, an instruction like a call or l call is encountered then a subroutine call is invoked and after whenever a call uh, this this kind of instruction is invoked then you have to uh, store store the program counter next address uh, in in stack so apart from this you have to use if there, there may be some other registers which are also uh, used by the main program 
and whenever the program returns from the subroutine, those registers may be used by the main program. In such a case, you have to store and restore registers. The registers which are used by main program, uh, they have to be stored and restored whenever you return from the subroutine before you return from the subroutine call. So, we have to take care of this storing and restoring of registers. And another important issue related to subroutines is the parameter passing. So, you know that in high level language program like C and other high level languages, there are techniques for passing parameters like call by value, call by name and so on. But in the case of assembly language programming, uh, we have to use somewhat different technique and we shall see how parameters can be passed from say main program to the subroutine and subroutine to the main program. So, there may be parameter passing involved uh, in two ways, sub main program to subroutine and subroutine to main program and we shall discuss about them how they can be done in the uh, uh, in, in the context of 8051 assembly language programming. Then another important issue is return from subroutine. Return from subroutine and we have seen uh, a special instruction is provided. Now let us discuss all these issues one after the other uh, before we discuss the interrupts. And all these issues together, they are known as subroutine linkage. Subroutine linkage. So, subroutine linkage involves invoking a call, that means then jumping to a subroutine, storing of the PC in the stack so that it can return to the point from where the uh, call took place and storing and restoring of registers, parameter passing and return from the subroutine. So, all these are together is known as subroutine linkage. Let us discuss uh, each of these issues one after the other. And you will see that in the context of subroutine call, the stack plays a very important role and particularly uh, whenever a subroutine is invoked, the stack is used and uh, also while returning, the stack is used as we shall see. First of all, let us see whenever a call encount is encountered, how the program counter, the, the address of the, ne the next instruction is stored in the stack. Let us see how it happens. Let us take up an example. Uh, let us assume in 0004 memory location, you have an instruction L call and it is jumping to a subroutine. Uh, subroutine uh, SUBR A, subroutine R. And uh, here you have got next instruction move, MOV, and uh, there is some, you are performing something, you are loading in the accumulator some absolute, uh, some immediate data, say 0 B 9 in hex. So, this this uh, instruction is of 3 bytes because it is a long call and this address is of 2 bytes. So, this will start from 0007. Now, as this is executed, the program counter is incremented. As you have seen, the program counter is uh, incremented uh, the, is by 2 because it is a, uh, here it will be incremented by 3 because here it is 4. It is a long call, so it is incremented by 3 in case of long call and uh, we shall store the lower order byte of program counter in stack by post incrementing it and the higher order byte in the next uh, stack locations and then uh, load the address which is provided as part of the instruction in the program counter. That is what happens. So, let us assume uh, before you call the subroutine, then before you call the subroutine, the stack was like this, stack was uh, like this, it was let us assume initialized with 07. 
S P is equal to 0 7. So, uh, in 0 8, 0 9 and 0 A some garbage data is there and after call, after call uh, we have seen that stack pointer is pre-incremented then the data is stored. So, uh, here in 0 8 memory location the lower order byte of address will go 0 7 will be stored in the next uh, location 0 9 the 0 0 higher order byte will be stored and the stack pointer will now have uh, will have the value uh, 0 9 stack pointer will have the value 0 9 and now let us assume that uh, let us see what happens whenever return occurs suppose this is where your that subroutine is appearing S U B R A and uh, some instructions are there and this is where the return is encountered. That means, it will execute these instructions and un until return is return instruction is encountered. So, when the return is encountered uh, what will happen let us see after after return after return what is the condition of the stack. After returning as the return instruction is executed the program stack pointer uh, from the stack the addresses this 0007 will be popped up and then it will go to the program counter as you can see here the stack pointer value is load is loaded into the uh, that um, in the higher order byte of program counter and lower order byte of program counter and stack pointer is decremented by 2 that, that is what will happen that means in 0 8 0 9 0 7 and 0 0 will be loaded however your program counter will be loaded by this 0 0 0 7 this will take place and stack pointer will have the value uh, 0 7 because it is decremented by 2 as we have seen. So, uh, this is the role of stack in subroutine linkage particularly while invoking a subroutine and also while returning. So, when in when uh, you are invoking a, a call that time the program counter value that means address of the next instruction is stored in the stack and when you re and, uh, return then this value is loaded in the program counter so that the then the execution can start from this point uh, this from this is uh, from this is the location from where the after return instruction execution will take place so this is one issue of subroutine linkage let us see the other issues and i told that you have to uh, store and restore some of the register values some of the parameters which are uh, used in which are sto uh, stored in the registers by the main program and this example illustrate uh, that particular issue. So, here we see uh, this is the main program it is originating from 0 0 0 memory locations here you are loading uh, a with some value and register r 4 with some value and register R6 with some value, then you are calling a delay routine and delay subroutine and the delay subroutine uh, unfortunately has used R4 and R6 as the uh, count parameters counter registers for, uh, for uh, generating the delay. So, since R4 and R6 are being used as uh, counter registers in the delay routine, uh, here you see as it jumps to the uh, delay routine and before that this program counter is uh, storing that 009 as I have already told that means here as you encounter this instruction after call the stack will have this value. So, let us assume stack pointer was before call before call the stack pointer was having the value uh, 07. Now, after this call it will have the value uh, 0 9 as we have already seen and in 0 8 and 0 9 location this, this values will be stored 0 9 and 0 0. Now, uh, 
as you jump to the subroutine, then subroutine has to save the register values R4 and R6 register values. And uh, as you can see here, the registers are, are also accessed as memory locations because push and pop uses only the uh, direct addressing. So, whenever you perform push 4, that means this value 9A it will be uh, loaded into 0A memory location and the stack pointer will be incremented by 1. And as you push this 6, then the 5, 5 will be stored in uh, 0B memory location of stack and uh, stack pointer will be still incremented by 1. Now, I, you can use R4 and R6 in your uh, delay generation routine. I am not explaining that. This part that you are loading some uh, count uh, that parameters initializing these R4 and R5. These are the count register values which you are using for generation of delay and this is your delay routine. This part, this part is your delay routine. I mean, which is used for delay routine. So, this is initialization of the registers and this is one loop and this is another loop. So, by using nested loop delay routine, using nested loop, which I have already explained in detail, is performed. And after that, you have to uh, pop up these values because you have to store, restore these uh, registers, those 6 and 4, the, the were in the reverse order. As you can see here, stack is a first in, first out uh, type of data structure. So, the, the, the uh, popping up will take place in the reverse order. And so, in the register 6, this value will be loaded 5, 5 as it was earlier, register 6, uh, register 6 uh, will be popped, uh, so pop, uh, you have pushed, this is 5, 5 was in, sorry, uh, I, I made a mistake, register 4 it was, uh, register 4 in, uh, initially, then it was 9, 8, register 6 also 9, 8, same values are restored. And so, 9, 8 will be restored here, pop 6 and pop, uh, pop 4 that 98 and 98 will be loaded in these two registers and then return will take place. So, here you see before using these registers, the registers are pushed in the stack and then popped from the stack before return is taking place. So, and so that the uh, in the subsequent part of the main program, you can see here the register 4 content is used uh, for some calculation and so on. So, register 6 content may be used in subsequent part. So, you can see here, this is how stack can be used for storing and restoring the important values stored in the register and uh, the, so that the, your main program execution does not lead to any incorrect result. So, this example illustrates how storing and restoring of registers take place using stack. Now, let us come to the third important point that is your uh, parameter passing. We have already discussed this and this. Now, we shall come to parameter passing. Now, parameter passing uh, can be done in a number of ways. As we have already discussed in the context of 8085 assembly language programming. And uh, first and the simplest way of passing parameter, the fastest and simplest way is to use a register. So, this example illustrates how uh, the parameter passing is done, can be done by using a register. So, what this program does, it loads some value 0, 0 to accumulator 0, 0. Then it, uh, it loads the in port 1, it transfers this value to port 1 and then it is loading a register with some value uh, 250 decimal. This is the decimal since you have not put 
any uh, age here. So, it is a decimal number, this is considered as decimal number, this 250 will be loaded in this register. And this is the register which is being used by the main program to pass parameter to the subroutine. So, this is the here parameter loaded in a register. in a register. So, parameter is being loaded in a register, then you are calling the delay routine. And let us see how this parameter is being used in the delay routine. So, it jumps to this delay routine, this is where the delay routine is stored. And as you can see here, the delay routine uses the register R2, content of R2, R2 and keeps on looping here until it becomes 0. And as it becomes 0, so D, J, N, Z decrement and jump not 0, it keeps on looping here. So, loops until until uh, R2, content of R2 is 0. And after it becomes 0, then it uh, returns from the subroutine and goes back to this point, goes back to this point and again it executes some instruction, loads the accumulator with FF. Uh, and which is transferred to the port 1 and again uh, you load register R2 to pass another parameter. So, here also uh, loads parameter, parameter in R2. So, here also we find that another parameter is being loaded by in R2 and again it is being passed to the subroutine and subroutine uses that to generate delay. Obviously, uh, the delay time in this case will be little longer than the previous case. In the previous case, R2 was loaded with 250, now it is being loaded with 255 and uh, so the delay generated second time will be little longer because the parameter value is little different uh, from the previous case. So, a longer delay generated this time and whenever the uh, R2 becomes 0, then it again return back to the this point and then it keeps on looping. That means, it keeps on generating uh, putting 1 1 up and that is retained on the port for some time and then it um, uh, loads FF and again generates another delay for some time and keeps on looping that way. So, the port uh, 1 will have all 0 and all 1 values for uh, 2 delay durations as it is shown here. So, here we see the delay routine subroutine is receiving a parameter uh, through a register. That means, the main program in this example, the main program is passing parameter through a register and in this case, the register between that is being used is R2. So, this is the simple and fast, simple and fast way of passing parameter. But as you know, the number of registers available in a processor is very limited. As you have seen, uh, we have got only one register, register bank available at a time and in the register bank, you have got 8 registers R0 to R7. So, these are the registers which can be used for passing parameters, but there is a possibility that the number of parameters may ex exceed 8. In such a case, what will you do? Obviously, the parameter passing cannot be done by using registers. So, in such a case, you have to take help of the main memory. So, let us see how we can pass parameter using uh, memory. So, in this example, the parameter passing take place using uh, the uh, data RAM or the memory of, memory of the uh, processor. Uh, so, in this example, uh, this example is a linear search. Uh, we have already explained this uh, example uh, in the context of program looping. Uh, this subroutine is a linear search, L search, linear search program and uh, the, the data is being stored starting from memory location 40H. So, this is your uh, starting address of the data and uh, the and the total number of bytes to be searched is 50. That means, these are the two parameters we would like to pass, pass to the uh, subroutine. This is the number of 
number of bytes to be searched and this is the address of memory location address of memory where the data is stored these two parameters are to be passed to the subroutine so in this case although we are passing to registers but, um, but uh, the data the parameters are stored in main memory so what we are doing we are taking help of registers to inform from which memory location uh, up to which memory location the data is being stored parameters are stored your parameter is being stored from starting from port 0 uh, and in consecutive uh, 50 location and uh, and also the uh, where this particular data 49 appears that is being returned uh, with the help of a register this register r3 uh, points to the memory location where this particular data is also stored this parameter is being passed from the subroutine to the main program so the memory location parameter is passed with the help of registers by using indirect addressing as you can see so uh, after loading these two registers r0 and r2 and r0 by using these two parameters then uh, the subroutine call takes place and it jumps to the subroutine and as you can see here in the subroutine this is the uh, this is the program that does uh, linear search we have already so this is linear search and it perform a sequential search whatever you call it the searching takes place and this program I have already explained the uh, one after the other search takes place and whenever uh, if a data is found it is stopped and then the content of as you can see here you are loading the value of r0 into a and uh, that is the r0 is holding the address actually this will be r0 r0 is being uh, loaded into the content of memory location pointed by r0 is loaded in the accumulator then it is compared with this data 49 and if it is not same then it it keeps on incre it increments the r0 to point to the next memory location and then it does the decrement of r2 so that uh, it keeps count about the total number of uh, search that has to take place so when it exceeds 50 then it stops uh, and uh, here as you uh, whenever the number is found then it jumps to this point and since r0 is holding the address it is uh, this value is loaded in the r3 and then it returns so r3 is now having the memory location address where the data uh, 49 is stored and which you have found by searching so this is an example where uh, the parameter passing is illustrated with the help of a uh, memory location however we are taking help of the register uh, to as a pointer register which is pointing to memory locations and so we are taking help of registers and memories for passing parameters uh, with the help of this program so this illustrates parameter passing using memory what are the other alternatives we have seen that stack can be used uh, for uh, storing the value of program counter and when you return that program counter value is uh, reloaded into the program counter so that you can return from the from where the subroutine call takes place and also you have seen how the stack can be used also for uh, storing and restoring register values why not use stack for parameter passing and this is being illustrated with the help of this example passing parameters using stack so this example illustrates how parameter passing can be done with the help of stack so here as you can see uh, this particular program uses two registers r4 and r6 to have some value and these are the parameters uh, parameters for delay so delay parameters So this is one delay parameter 
one and this is another delay parameter. And these two delay parameters are stored in registers R4 and R6. And instead of using the registers for passing parameter, what we do here, these two values are stored in stack. So here we are store, storing in the stack, we are pushing it uh, to uh, pushing it uh, here that register content 4 is pushed and register content 6 is pushed and uh, then you are calling the delay. Let us see what have what is the status of the stack after you execute this uh, uh, call instruction. So initially let us assume the uh, stack was pointing to 0 7, stack pointer was having the value 0 7. Now as you push this the uh, this value uh, 4 6 this 4 6 will be stored in uh, 0 8 and stack pointer will be incremented by 1 then as you push 6 this uh, 9 8 will be stored in uh, 0 9 and stack pointer will be incremented by 1 then as as this this is uh, this instruction is executed l call the next two values uh, will hold the, uh, the pro PC L and PC H so in 0 A and 0 B memory location. So PC L and PC H will be hold stored that means this is the address, this is the program counter value. This program counter value will be stored, this is the next address, this is the next instruction. That address will be stored here and stack pointer will now have the value 8, 9, uh, 10, 11 that means B it will be having 0. Now it jumps to the interrupt this particular subroutine delay, delay subroutine and as it jumps to this delay subroutine as you can see here uh, what you want, you want to uh, get these values which are stored in stack to be loaded into uh, some other registers uh, for for uh, delay generation say R2 and R3 to do that R2 and R1 which are used in your delay generation. So but uh, unfortunately stack has been now in pointing to this location. So you have to decrement it um, subtract 2 that means decrement twice so that stack pointer points to uh, this this value that means content of R6. So the content of R6, so that is why these two instructions are executed DECS3 uh, stack pointers are decremented twice to point to this location where the parameter is stored and then it is popped and, and as you pop it then it points to the next location 46 then uh, the 46 is loaded in register 3. In, uh, three then you perform this uh, using these two values uh, stored in 1 and 3 you perform the uh, delay generation and as you perform the delay generation uh, as you can see here stack pointer will now point will have the value 0 7 because it has been decremented by 4 because earlier it was uh, 0 b uh, and so on so it will decrement to this value. So, uh, here we have to increment by 4 so that it points to 0 b so that uh, the uh, it will have 0 8 so it, it points to 0 b because uh, before whenever you return your stack pointer should point to this so that these two are loaded into the program counter. So here you see this, uh, this particular uh, housekeeping has to be done for proper use of stack so that you do not push or pop in wrong locations or wrong locations are long wrong data is not loaded in program counter as you return. So with the help of this decrement and increment instructions the stack pointer is uh, value is adjusted so that the, uh, the, the stack pointer points to uh, right values and the, the program works. So in this case what we have done uh, we have explained how stack can be used for parameter passing and uh, 
since the stack can be quite big, uh, here we have passed only two parameters, it is possible to pass a large number of parameters because it is your uh, stack is implemented in RAM, although you have a stack pointer register and uh, you can pass a number of parameters with the help of stack. So, stack also uh, plays a very important role in parameter passing. So, we have discussed various issues related to subroutine linkage parameter passing and return from subroutine we have already discussed uh, earlier. Here for example, that return how return takes place we have already discussed that program counter is loaded with this value from the stack. So, uh, these are the important issues in the context of subroutine. You have to when you write program, you have to uh, take care of all these issues so that this uh, proper subroutine linkage take place. Now, after discussing these subroutines, let us now focus our attention to interrupts. Interrupts. As we have already discussed, interrupts are whenever an interrupt occurs, jump takes place to a interrupt service subroutine. That means, uh, but what is the key difference between an interrupt and a subroutine? As we have seen, a subroutine call appears in a program. In all the examples, we have seen that subroutine call appears in a program. So, here we see the subroutine call is appearing in a program. So, we know when a particular subroutine call will take place as the program execution take place and reaches that particular point subroutine call will take place. On the other hand, interrupt source is usually outside, outside the processor. Interrupt will come from outside and as a consequence we do not know when an interrupt will take place. So, we can say that interrupt interrupt is an interrupt is an asynchronous event and as a result it can happen anytime and uh, it can happen in the middle of a uh, of an instruction execution say as you know the execution of an instruction may require at least one machine cycle comprising 12 clock periods or it may require uh, two machine cycles comprising 24 clock cycles. So, whenever an interrupt occurs in the middle of an instruction, what it will do? So, in such a case, what the processor does? Uh, interrupt the processor, uh, the, the the microcontroller finishes the execution of the execution of the current instruction. So, the current instruction will be executed, it will not be interrupted in the middle because uh, uh, then it is it will be very difficult to keep track up to which point of the instruction it was executed. So, the, mic the microprocessor microcontroller this is also true for microprocessor microcontroller will finish the execution of the current instruction. This is the first thing first difference between the interrupt and subroutine. So, interrupts are asynchronous in nature and as a consequence whenever interrupt occurs the processor may be executing uh, an instruction and if it happens in the middle of an ex instruction execution, it will execute the instruction. Then second thing that it has to do, it also it saves the, the uh, address of the next instruction, address of the next instruction as it is done in case of subroutine. So, 
So, address of the next instruction was also stored in the in, in the case of subroutine. So, here also it the processor will save the address of the next instruction in the same manner in the stack. However, apart from saving the address of the next instruction, it also it also saves it also saves the current status of all interrupts so current status of all interrupts will be saved however it is not saved in not saved not in stack it is not saved in stack. There are some special purpose registers like say priority level active flip flop. This is a non accessible register. So, priority level uh, flip flop and there are few more registers as we, as we shall see where these the status current status of interrupts are also saved. Now, another uh, important difference is that uh, here the uh, for fast context switching, for fast context switching, the uh, the new microcontroller jumps to jumps to some fixed ve vector addresses. fixed vector addresses. You may be asking why this is done? Why the processor uh, is not uh, here it is not kept flexible? The, the, the microprocessor could have the program that, uh, the, that address could have been supplied from outside it could have been anything. But for, uh, for fast context switching. Uh, there are some fixed addresses as we have seen in, in, in the case of our interrupts, there are some fixed addresses like these are the interrupts in the context of 8085, 8051 we have already discussed in details. There are 5 interrupts apart from this set. So, we see there each of them is having a fixed vector address. So, jump will take place to these locations fixed location. This has two implications. Number one is this leads to fast context switching because uh, if this address is not known, then the source of an interrupt has to be identified with the help of a interrupt level subroutine by software pooling, which is a slow process. So, to avoid this slow process in the, in the context of my controllers, this uh, vector addresses are used and fast context switching is very important in the context of uh, your real time control application which are you know, used in your uh, embedded application and particularly interrupt service is bread and butter in your uh, embedded application. So, as you can see they will jump to fixed location and the second implication of this is since these addresses are fixed and these are ROM based. So, interrupt service subroutines are ROM based because their addresses does not change with time. This is not true for uh, general subroutines. In case of subroutines we have seen the addresses are uh, taken from the program. Moreover, what can happen uh, in a uh, virtual memory environment whenever the programs are swapped in and swapped out uh, from between main memory and uh, secondary storage in a general purpose uh, computer and computer processing environment. There the at uh, different instances of execution the same subroutine may be stored in different memory locations and as a result the subroutines are always loaded in RAM rather than in ROM. On the other hand, interrupt service subroutines are uh, usually uh, ROM based. 
second uh, uh, and another important issue here is uh, for first con for fast context switching another uh, built in feature is provided by the uh, 8051 processors what is the built in feature the built in feature that is provided is the register bank we have already discussed the processor is provided with four register banks suppose before interrupt uh, the processor was using the register bank r0 and uh, whenever interrupt occurs what can be done just by changing these two bits that program status word bits you can switch to some other register bank so this this can be done with the help of uh, just writing uh, these two bits in this registers on the other hand if you have to save all the registers of register bank 0 in the you have to if you want to you have to push it in the stack uh, the way we have seen the, uh, the the parameters are stored in the stack then restored from stack that takes quite long time this facility of register banks allows you fast context switching so as you return from the subroutine that means whenever you jump from the main program to the interrupt service subroutine you change the register bank and maybe in the interrupt service subroutine you use the new register bank and as you return from the interrupt service subroutine to the main program again you switch the register bank the which is the, orig the original one which was being used by the uh, main program so in this case the, uh, the the you are just by switching the register bank you are taking very short time for uh, save, uh, for saving uh, storing and restoring the processor status so these are the important issues then you have got another important issue that is your that is your return instruction you see uh, why you require a separate return instruction as we have seen the processor uh, is already provided with a uh, return instruction for subroutine why do you require require a separate instruction for interrupt subit subroutine the need for that is uh, whenever this processor is executing returning from subroutine it has to restore only the uh, program counter value that has to be taken from the stack and loaded into the program counter however uh, uh, the processor in addition to this it has to perform something else whenever it, it is returning from subroutine uh, returning from interrupt service subroutine to understand that let us look at the, uh, the, the different types of priorities that is provided in your uh, uh, interrupts we know that apart from enabling and disabling of interrupt which we have already discussed with the help of this uh, uh, this uh, this particular register this ie register interrupt enable register you can individually disable or enable interrupts or whole interrupt system can be enabled or disabled by using this enable interrupt uh, is, uh, bit so you can use the set uh, set bit or reset bit instruction to enable or disable the interrupt but apart from that as you can see here each source of interrupt can be programmed to one of the two priority levels that means these five interrupts can have two different levels of priority let's assume the we we, we call it zeroth level and first level say this one that external interrupt 0 external interrupt 1 and the serial mode has the uh, priority level 1 and these two have the priority level 0 this information this priority information this the uh, uh, priority priority uh, of an interrupt in execution in execution it is stored in it 
stored in a uh, priority level active flip flop. This is called priority level active flip flop. There are two flip flops. One is for uh, uh, higher priority, another is for lower, lower priority. So, whenever the there are two flip flops, one is for higher priority and one is for lower priority. So, whenever the higher priority level active flip flop is active, that means it is set, then it will not allow any low priority level interrupt to be, to be, uh, to be accepted. On the other hand, if a low priority level interrupt is in active, then it will allow high priority level interrupt to be activated. So, let us see how actually it happens and whenever you are returning from uh, interrupt, then you have to restore this priority level because whatever was the priority level before interrupt, the same priority level should exist as you return from the interrupt level subroutine, interrupt service subroutine. So, to facilitate that you require a separate instruction which also restores the priority level interrupt flip flop in addition to loading the program counters from the stack. Now, let us see how it happens uh, whenever there is a tie. So, here we have seen uh, that the processors are having uh, different priorities. As you have seen, the interrupts are having different priorities. Priority level, client is 0 has the highest priority, serial has the lowest priority. But now, because of this, we have made PS uh, that is serial interrupt, external interrupt 1 and external interrupt 2 has the uh, of higher priority. So, in that context, what we, you, you will have two different priority level, high and low. So, in the high priority level, highest one will have this uh, uh, as you can see, serial has the lowest priority. So, PS will have the lowest, then your uh, INT0 and INT1. So, INT0 and INT1. In the low priority, you have the PT0 and then PT1 timer. So, PT0 and PT1. That means, whenever the processor is executing an interrupt service subroutine corresponding to this say a, a, a serial mode of data transfer. If an interrupt occurs because of PTO that means uh, the timer, it will not be accepted because that priority level active flip flop will ensure that the low priority level interrupt is not uh, accepted. On the other hand, if it is executing say uh, it a timer uh, related interrupt service subroutine and if INT0 occurs, then interrupt will be accepted and then as it returns from this interrupt to this, then it will, uh, then that uh, priority level active flip flop will switch from high priority to low priority. Now, suppose in the case of tie, whenever uh, two interrupts of the same level uh, are uh, generated simultaneously say INT0 and PS have occurred simultaneously, which one will be accepted? They belong to the same priority level, then what will be done? This uh, they will be sensed in this order. Since INT0 has the higher priority because of uh, this built in feature of the processor, this will be accepted rather than this, although both are having the same priority level. What I am trying to tell among the two priority levels, there is also different uh, relative priorities and relative priorities are defined by the processor uh, in this order. INT0 as the highest one, then the timer 0, then, inter, uh, then the external interrupt 1, then the timer 1, then the serial 1. So, uh, whenever two interrupts of the same priority level are uh, uh, occur simultaneously, then we have to make use of this, uh, this particular, this, uh, this level, this particular priority levels uh, which is built in and uh, it is resolved. 
So, uh, viewers, uh, in this lecture, we have discussed in detail various issues of subroutine linkage, and we have also discussed the uh, various issues related to interrupt, particularly how interrupts or interrupts of the subroutine differs from uh, subroutine calls. Thank you.